Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's a great pleasure and, uh, to speak here. And of course, this is a very hard job I have and, uh, just after these nice snacks and, uh, to keep you and, uh, after lunch awake. So I put in a couple of videos and hopefully keep your attention and, uh, this way. So, okay, this is not working, then we do it this way. My motivation uh, to look at artificial system is uh, given uh, here, and, uh, despite a lot of progress uh, in the last decade, and, uh, just to mention these, all these face recognition competitions, which are quite good and, uh, and with very good success rates, and you all know about the DAFA challenges, and, uh, we are still uh, far away from matching human performance. On the other hand, the cognitive neuroscience has made great progress in uh, unraveling some of the uh, algorithms behind face recognition and object recognition and navigation and spatial cognition and all these uh, issues. So uh, that's why I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit uh, and try to see what we can learn uh, from perception and cognition. So just uh, to, to tell you, and I don't have to tell you because probably most of you are from uh, engineering. And, uh, so there is already and, uh, quite, quite good success in computer vision. And, uh, when you look at, and, uh, for example, the competitions in, in recognizing and categori categorizing scenes, in, for example, into faces, and, uh, motorbikes, bicycles, there, and, uh, the performance on, on, on one uh, test, and actually I forgot which one it really was, and, uh, and, uh, was, I mean, quite impressive, was 92% correct. But when you look at actually what the algorithms looked at, and, uh, and here are the, the features which they used and, uh, for, for recognition, in, in all of these images, and, uh, this algorithm picked this as a very and, uh, prominent, important feature which is actually not part of the car, but it's a shadow of the car. So uh, you can imagine what happens if you are not in California, and, uh, but maybe in, in, in England or in, uh, in Europe, and, uh, where there are no shadows. I think it's not really such a good idea and, uh, to rely on, on that. And that's part of the problem. I mean, this is only, I mean, there are many, many other issues, but and, uh, I think you know, we are much more robust, you know, and although the British can recognize cars. So, <laughs> so you, know, you all know the DARPA challenge, for, for those of you, you, know, you know, who, who don't know it, you know, that was in 2004. You know, there was, you know, yeah, actually I should, you know, there was this $2 million prize to go autonomously you know, without a driver in a car, it could be any kind of car, and, uh, over 132 miles and, uh, of a desert course. Actually, they had previous one, which was much shorter, but no one finished. But already, uh, I think two years later, in 2004, and, uh, actually, they could drive. I have a video, but I don't show it, and, uh, because most of you know it. And, uh, two cars, uh, and, uh, one car, with a German car, of course, and, uh, and a German, uh, and, uh, Sebastian Thun, and, uh, who is unfortunately not in Germany, but at Stanford, but and, uh, and, uh, he, he won this and, uh, race through the desert and, uh, in six hours, uh, a little bit less than seven hours, and there were also two more cars who managed this. So, I mean, I think that is quite, quite an amazing achievement, and I show you, and, uh, yeah, then two years or three years later, DARPA set out another challenge and uh, so they said, I mean, okay, now we can drive through the desert. Let's try it really in the city with uh, real Californian driving rules. I don't know what the driving laws there are, but uh, probably not as stiff as in, stiff in Switzerland. But uh, nevertheless, uh, they wanted to have all university teams uh, to compete against each other uh, with their cars in a city with uh, yeah, mm, obeying driving laws. And uh, this was a pretest. This is Sebastian Trun. Can I make it louder here? Mm, uh, actually. You see, a computer system, like the trunk usually is, there's a big computer station here, 
there's a GPS system over here, a connection hub over here, a power control box over here, and this box over here is the interface to the car itself. So this box over here talks to the car and lets us, by computer, actuate things like steering, brake, and gas and throttle. Then, also important, is this perception of the vehicle. So you see down here, sensors on the wheel over here, these guys over here, it's like industry, they have sensors, and they're able to perceive the environment and build a model inside the vehicle as to what the environment looks like. So, I mean, you hear the cars can perceive, they can build models, and, uh, they can build representations of the environment, and, uh, at least and, uh, that's what he says. And, I mean, quite successful, and, uh, they actually go through the environment, but not all of it. So here's the MIT, and he is a little bit reluctant, the car. He doesn't know what to do, but now finally, everybody's exciting, it goes. So, but nah, the MIT car didn't anticipate the other car. Nah, so that was nah, not so nice. Nah, and they didn't win this competition. And at this competition, uh, actually, yeah, the, the team from Pittsburgh managed, and Stanford got the second place. So, and MIT and they all failed in one way or the other. So, you can say, well, so what? I think there's still a long way to go, and, and part of the reason is that, yes, I mean, they need, you just saw the trunk full of, full of computers, and I think with our less than a kilogram, uh, and also with very low power consumption, we actually do these tasks much better. Also what you saw in, in uh, the, the short video is uh, all these cars actually have active sensors. They have the laser scanners, and that's actually a very a nice tool to build really three-dimensional maps of the environment and uh, but that's not what we are using and I'm, I'm very happy that we are not using active uh, vision so to speak acting active uh, laser scanner because uh, what happened when they started you know, this competition they were all lined up and, and started to go nothing really worked because the cars were blinding each other with their lasers, because, I mean, there were lots of laser scanners and, uh, and laser beams flying around, and uh, the sensors didn't like that so much. So I think we are much better off with passive uh, vision and also with all our low power passive sensing, uh, which we have. Artificial systems, and that especially in uh, what, we, what we have seen in these face recognition competition or the object categorization competitions, they use really uh, and require uh, usually a very large training set. While we know and we heard about what, what babies can do uh, and how fast and, uh, they can learn. And I think if you uh, tell your little child uh, uh, when the little child sees a dog and, and you say that's a dog, from that on, basically with one shot learning, I mean, you don't have to show many examples of dogs and they can recognize any kind of dog and distinguish it even from a cat. And maybe not in the very beginning, they make mistakes, but much, much less training sets than what, what we currently use in these face and object categorization competitions. And I showed you that with, with the shadow. I mean, n there is much poorer generalization n n capabilities n you know, of artificial systems. While we, we are pretty good, as I just said, I mean, you can recognize one dog, you can recognize all dogs. N uh, so I think we should be able to build smarter n uh, artificial <coughs> and even autonomous systems by learning something and that's not only the motivation for my talk, but for my whole work. And, and uh, so I, I'm actually a biologist by training. And, and uh, in 2000, and, uh, I ran the first uh, 
biologically motivated computer vision uh, conference in Seoul, Korea, and there uh, was in the next one in Tübingen. But then uh, somehow uh, in this kind of conference stopped uh, because nobody really wanted to take over. And I got more interested in uh, a, a new conference, which I was also a founding member of, which was the APGV, which always runs along with SIGGRAPH uh, every second year. And that's perceptually motivated graphics and, and vision. And then uh, in 2004, I created an, uh, an, uh, a, a special ACM journal, Transaction on Applied Perception, where we really try to bring in the cognitive science, perception people, and engineers, and computer vision people, and computer graphics people in, uh, together and in, um, have a common forum for, for their publications. And then there are many European projects in cognitive systems. Now you all are more or less part of it, and we have participated in, in some of those. And very recently, last fall, I, I, I went to Korea because there was a new department for brain and cognitive engineering being built. And I went there and, uh, on this world-class university program done by the Korean environment. And there is really an enormous amount of energy in, in Korea. And I was actually, I mean, thrilled. And uh, I was there for three months teaching and building a new lab. And I, it was really an amazing experience and I think we, we have to work hard here if we want to, I mean they are behind us but I don't know for much much longer so I mean they, they put a lot of money and energy into developing the, the Korean University. Korea University is one of the they have three, the three best are Seoul National, Yonsei and, and Korea University and they really try to put that on the map. That's the goal of the government and uh, I think there's, you will hear more from them in the next five years. So in this talk, so finally I come to the overview, and, um, I, I will highlight uh, four, four topics. And, uh, and uh, I will start and, uh, with the need for and, uh, spatial temporal and, uh, representation. Then I will talk about perception of and, uh, material properties. It's not only shape, but also the material, which we are very good in recognizing, which are part of objects, so it's an important issue. And then I will show you uh, that you should not rely only on one sensor. We heard that also this morning, and uh, I mean, already babies um, interact with objects, not only by looking at them, but grasping and, and putting them in, into their mouth. So uh, we, we try to figure out a little bit more about that. And then finally, uh, coupling perception and action. And in order to do this, I have a, a large group, and I mean, half of them uh, are engineers, and uh, the other half uh, are psychologists, and then I have also other n n n people in, in the lab, and I think the, the number of engineers is, is slowly growing, and, n but I, I'm always n very happy. My best n PhD students came from, from physics so, n and, and mathematics, so I think that's n very, very important. And of course, you need also a support team. And you need, and that's m really my, my philosophy, I mean, n uh, we are doing mainly n uh, multisensory perception in our lab, but I find it very, very important to interact with computer vision and computer graphics. Because, I mean, we can give biological inspiration to computer vision that was this biologically motivated computer vision conference, and a lot of n uh, computer vision people got interested in the biological motivation. But I also find it very important to, to really have a rigorous theory to motivate, to guide really our uh, perception experiments. And the same thing is also with computer graphics. We, put, uh, we use a lot of computer graphics technology and virtual reality technology in our, in, uh, in our labs because, I mean, we want these tools to make really realistic experiments and, uh, and not working with sine wave gratings, I mean, the, which, and <coughs> hyperacuity experiments and these kind of classical you know, psychophysics experiments because, I mean, our build world is not built to deal with sine wave gratings, but we have to interact with the real world. So we use this technology really you know, to, to build controllable environments, virtual environments. 
And uh, on the other hand, also, I think we can actually uh, bring back something also into computer graphics, and you will, I will show you uh, later that you can learn something and build uh, heuristics actually to build faster and more efficient computer graphic systems. So that's uh, what I show, and uh, my, as I just said, I mean, my research in philosophy is study perception action with stimuli as close as possible to the real world. And since I went to Korea, and, uh, I, and, uh, I thought and, uh, it would be interesting to see how I, my, my face is changing. This was before I went there. I was uh, much heavier. And, uh, and uh, I lost 14 kilos in Korea because I was also working hard as the Koreans and, and, uh, and also exercised a lot and, uh, because that's what they do too. And also the food is very much healthier than ours. So we used our morphable model and, uh, before I went there to see how I would look like and, and, uh, and uh, I can make myself with our morphable model. This is some old work. And, uh, which was done in our lab. And, uh, so we have a really parametrically controlled and, uh, model. And so we just said, and, and uh, we make me more and, uh, Korean like. And, uh, I don't think that I look this way now, but and, uh, this is just to show you that we have parametric control over faces. I can also make my face more female like, or prettier, or less pretty, and, and older and younger. So that's some technology which we developed a long time ago in the lab, and it's used a lot in face recognition experiments. And now recently we, we moved also not to static faces, but uh, animated faces. So I show you now here uh, uh, something which we uh, submitted a couple of years ago to SIGGRAPH as a video. This is Martin Bright who made this video of his face, but it's not a video of his face, it's a video of a computer graphic model. And so it can really be animated. He can make faces, but it's, it's a 3D model of his face. And I think you, know, you probably agree with me that it looks pretty realistic. So that's another technology which we use in our lab you know, to look at you know, facial expression recognition. And since I went to uh, the, in the Korea University to build there the biological cybernetics lab, uh, we are trying right now to build a Korean face database and also build a Korean morphable model like our morphable model. And uh, my idea uh, was then to do cross-cultural investigation of perception of ethnicity. I mean, we, you all know the other race effect when we go into, into Asia, I mean, and I experienced that too. I had a lot you know, of difficulties to recognize you know, you know, the students, but after some time, you, you gain the you know, expertise you know, and, and, and learn them. I wouldn't say that I can learn the names. This is still a big problem, but you know, I can visually distinguish them. You know, we also want to build in a Korean facial expression database and then also look at you know, you know, recognition of you know, facial expressions. And also the facial expressions in Asia and, uh, and, uh, are and, uh, much different. And, uh, some students, and, uh, they, they really, when, when you interact with them, they don't really show a lot of facial expressions. So you never know really if they understand or if they are happy or not happy. And, uh, but also that develops. So I mean, I can read them a little bit better even after you know, only learning three, three months. So, but this is something which we, with our morphable model and with parametric control about uh, the amount of expressions, and I will show you later in, uh, in, uh, some more of it, and, uh, we will be able to study this in, in very controlled psychophysical experiments. And then I'm also very much interested, and I will talk about that at the end, but just a little teaser and, uh, for, for this and, uh, to keep you awake, another video here. And, uh, we study spatial cognition, how we navigate in, in, in cities, in, uh, in environments. And a long time ago, I built a, a virtual model of, of uh, tubing, and here's uh, just a drive-through. Uh, this is not a video of tubing. It's really we rebuilt the, the inner, the old part of tubing and, uh, as, as a computer graphics model. And then we can, with our cyber bicycle, we can cycle through it, we can drive through it and with our omnidirectional treadmill, which I will show you, we can walk through it. And then we can learn this environment to naive and, and, and people who have never been, 
in Tübingen, we sometimes play this trick when we have visitors who have not been in, in, in Tübingen. And, uh, and, and for a and they come for a talk and then we uh, let them uh, go through virtual tubing, point out the restaurant we are going at for dinner and then we let them uh, find uh, the restaurant in, uh, in real tubing. And it usually works. <laughs> so, and we, we also build com completely in a novel kind of simulator. So I will show you a motion simulator. Later I will show you in walking simulators, but we have also haptic simulators. And uh, we all do that in, in a new building, in, uh, which in, uh, the Max Planck Society was kind enough to give me. So I show you our latest edition. That's where we will show that video at ICRA in, in Anchorage in, uh, in May. So. This is our Formula One simulator. Here you see the acceleration, and we simulate acceleration and braking by using the tilt. So when you look at the neck, I mean, it's not, he doesn't need a, a strong leg like Michael Schumacher, but I mean, he's been shaken around quite a bit. We have up to half a G to a G accelerations here, especially for the lateral movements. Front back is limited you know, through the construction of the robot arm. But you know, it's a very much more realistic feeling than doing it just with, with vision alone. So this required quite a bit of engineering to do real-time control, and that's the work of you know, Paolo Rubufo Giordano and, and our, our team. So there is, no <clears throat> this gives us a lot of possibilities actually to study multi-sensory integration of vision, vestibular, seat of the pants feeling, we, the driving and, and the steering wheel has, has force feedback so we can really measure if we lose grip of the road and, and all these things and, uh, can be now and, uh, very well controlled. So, but before I, I talk more about n n our research, this was just a teaser to keep you awake at the beginning, n I, I tell you a little bit what, what other people n n found, and n I think there's a very nice working paper from, from Pavan Sinha, who suggests 19 insights from human face recognition every computer vision researcher should know about. That was the title n of his n presentation. And I show you just n a few of those. Can you recognize this person? Anybody? Okay, but most of you didn't, right? I think eyebrows are very important, maybe even more important than eyes. I think now you can recognize Nixon. Now all of you can recognize Nixon. There's something which, I mean, I think we didn't really think about how important eyebrows are for face recognition. So if you build face recognition systems, and, uh, or if you want to fake face recognition systems, maybe you shape off your eyebrows. So and, uh, you can recognize people from images even under very large distortions. Can you recognize these people there? Reagan. Reagan. For example, Bush. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> this is Dick Cheney. Oh. Yeah, but, uh, but and, uh, so I think you have no difficulties in uh, recognizing. And I mean, that's uh, a very old illusion, the Thatcher illusion, which is uh, important to know about. And uh, you all, most of you have seen this. So I mean, that's nothing new. It's from, from Thompson in 1980. Maybe uh, not everybody knows this artist, uh, Archimboldo. And, uh, he makes very nice vegetable paintings. And if you turn them around, and, uh, you can recognize faces. <coughs> so when faces are mm, uh, viewed upside down, our ability to process configurations are mm, uh, really disrupted. We don't see the strong configuration change in this image. I think computer vision systems probably wouldn't have uh, difficulties to do this in, uh, in rotation. I mean, that's just one equation. And, uh, so I mean. Some things really work quite different. For what is difficult for us, in, uh, in principle, should be very easy for, for computer vision systems, and unfortunately, also vice versa. 
interesting to know that, I mean, we are very good in recognizing familiar faces. And, uh, can you recognize uh, some of these faces? Yeah. Yeah. Bill Clinton. Elvis Presley, no. Okay, here they are. And, uh, so, I mean, the Americans, and, uh, I mean, this is uh, from MIT. I mean, I wouldn't have uh, picked Michael Jordan or Goldie Horn, and, uh, but I think most Americans know and, uh, these and, uh, more than, than us here. But nevertheless, I mean, you, you, you did very well. And, uh, but how, how good are we or how bad are we with unfamiliar faces? So imagine a bank robbery and, uh, and you see only this face here in a glance and you uh, go to a lineup and have to pick out this person. And even now you have it in front of you and you can go back and forth. I think you will have a difficulty. So does anybody uh, recognize which one is the correct? You, so we, we hear two, three, nine. It is actually three. No, so no. it's not easy. Hmm? And imagine you have seen this guy here only for a second in a bank robbery or on a, on a bad video. And, and so, I mean, one should be in, uh, quite skeptical with these lineup methods and, uh, and, and what, what people believe they have seen. And, uh, there's a whole research about that and also in psychology. And, uh, I don't want to go into this. And, uh, here's another example from Pavan. And, uh, it was a very, very nice and, uh, and, uh, from uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore, right? <laughs> or not? No, actually, it's, it's, it's both times. He, he cut out Bill Clinton and put it into an, uh, an, uh, the, the frame of Al Gore. And, and I mean, there's a lot in there. I mean, it, it's a, the hair do is important, but also, I mean, that they are both together and he stands behind him. So, I mean, there is really some top down influence on, on, on recognition. So, that's probably not something what we, what we should really build into uh, our uh, co uh, artificial cognitive systems. But it shows also uh, uh, that many recognition results can be uh, explained in, uh, in, in an image-based uh, recognition way. And that's actually what, what I am really like to uh, propose uh, uh, for quite some time now. That if, you, if you think about all the possible ways, uh, uh, this was the first uh, in the way how people thought we recognize objects. It was actually Tom Binford and not David Ma. David Ma got it in the ideas from Tom Binford, and the, the general, generalized cylinders. And, and uh, then uh, Biedermann uh, became uh, very well known with his recognition by components. David Lowe actually built in his PhD thesis the first system actually working on, on geon-like representations. And he had really a very hard time a lot of computer vision people uh, followed this approach uh, of building recognition system based on geometry. And even the, uh, the best ones like uh, Andrew Zissiman uh, uh, from the UK uh, gave up on, on it now and he's really now more an image-based guy. What, something which we proposed a, a long time ago that you really don't have to, to build uh, uh, spatial relations between parts of objects, but just use uh, image memory and, and, uh, <clears throat> and lots of it. But I'm not saying that we uh, store pictures of, of tea and teapots in our head, but I mean, and, uh, parts of it, fragments and, uh, like what, and what Ullmann and others and, uh, and also David Lowe is, 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 in, uh, is doing. So I mean, a lot of recognition system work really more on, on visual memory than on, on 3D reconstructions. And that's what we actually try to test in, uh, in, in already in 1992 when I was with Shimon Edelman at, at MIT. We, we try to look at viewpoint dependency on, of recognition and in, uh, then we had the hard time uh, to, to find objects in, uh, where we could do really clean experiments. We show an object from one viewpoint and uh, then try to recognize it from a novel viewpoint. 
That's difficult to do with familiar objects because you have seen a chair or a table or whatever, a car from all orientations already. So I mean, so that's why we created complex uh, objects like we call them bent paper clips, and you can make with computer graphic methods arbitrary number of it, and then you show you know, one paper clip and you show it. And this is just a view sphere as an in in illustration for the viewpoint. So the camera is looking from here and the camera is looking from here, and that's what you learn. You sh we show it from this viewpoint and from this viewpoint. Wiggle it a little bit around so that you get also a structure from motion, but otherwise you have stereo information and you have shape from shading. So you can build, in principle, in your head a complete three-dimensional model of this object. And then we tested this kind of object among other <coughs> similar way of bent paper clips, but they were bent in a different way. But they all had the same number of segments, so there were no low-level or simple features. They were all not colored. And then we tested them and looked from this viewpoint and looked from this viewpoint and looked from these up and down viewpoints so on another meridian. And what we found was that actually the recognition was much better for the view spanned by the training view. So these, this was much better. This was also OK, but this was very, very difficult. And Shimon Ullmann, in his very nice book in 96, made the conclusion, which we like. Now, of course, I mean, I could have said or cited myself here, but now I think it's always better if you cite Shimon Ullmann. And he said, I mean, there is no, no other, or it's difficult to reconcile with any theory except the image combination approach. So, <clears throat> this led then to, to many uh, other experiments, but interesting also, to, uh, it led to experiments in monkeys, because at, uh, when I was at MIT also, uh, Nikos Logothetis uh, was in Peter Schiller's lab, and uh, recording from uh, neurons in IT cortex, and we said, oh, why don't we test monkeys uh, with, uh, with these paper clips? And uh, I mean, to cut the long story short, uh, this, uh, we, we showed them from one viewpoint, and that's actually, when you go away from this viewpoint, the spike rate of, of neurons he found really dropped down dramatically. So they are very much tuned, not only to a particular paperclip. If you take another paperclip, no, there was no, one paperclip which was very good, and no, there were a few others, but they were, really very much tuned to the view and not to the three-dimensional structure because when you turn it away, you change the view, the spike rate dropped down. And there were a lot of other stories, but uh, I don't want to tell all old stories, but I just want to mention uh, that then uh, there was also uh, the work of uh, Shimon Edelman and Tommy Poggio where they actually used the same kind of paper clips again and trained a neural network and, uh, and uh, built out of tuned neurons in a radial basis function network. And what uh, you can build out of these tuned neurons, you can become viewpoint independent. And that's, of course, we want to be viewpoint independent in the end. And that's also what the monkeys in, in, in can do, but particular neurons can't do. And if we train enough, we can also become more viewpoint independent, even on these pa difficult paper clips. But um, initially, you, you have a very strong viewpoint dependency. Then, of course, people uh, start to complain about, especially my colleague, Irv Biedermann, who didn't like that at all, and said, ah, oh, this is, I mean, something special with these, n n n n with these objects. You should have done <coughs> geons, and then we did something with geon strings, and there was an actually a very, very interesting uh, in a conversation in, in a psychology journal, in, uh, which got a little bit out of hand until uh, the editor uh, uh, came in and uh, uh, toned it down a little bit, but I think uh, we won anyway. So, <laughs> uh, any, uh, but we did some, some experiments and also with faces and did exactly the same kind of experiments, train in faces from this viewpoint and this viewpoint, test the intermediate views, and you see here um, rotating away uh, from the training view. So this 
This is a recognition performance. The D prime is very good. It's also good when you go away, it's still spanned by the training views. You always have two training views here. So mm, uh, that mm, uh, is good. But if you go onto another meridian, you go up or down, your recognition performance drops down dramatically. And that is mm, uh, mm, very mm, uh, similar to what we found with the paper clips. So, mm, uh, and, and speaks in, in, in favor of mm, uh, view-based recognition. But there's still one problem, uh, and uh, so now we know that the physical similarity can account for recognition with small viewpoint changes, image-based recognition. But uh, how does the brain put all these views, which we see continuously in, uh, in, uh, of, of, of objects, how does the brain, when it gets all this information, put that all back and put the label airplane uh, to all these views? And the good thing is that our brain is not watching MTV video, where you really have a, a staccato kind of image flooding from all different directions. When we see the world, we move around an object, and all the views actually have temporal continuity. If I grasp something and explore something, I mean, I'm not seeing it from this viewpoint and from this viewpoint. No, I'm exploring it. And there's a temporal continuity. And that's actually something which we should really keep in mind when we build a recognition system and learn about objects. And so the, I think now the time issue, the need for spatial temporal recognition. And I show you only one, one quick experiment which we did in order to test the hypothesis that uh, the time is really binding the different views together. So, I mean, what do you think? Are these uh, two different people turning the head or is it the same person turning a head? No. It looks like the same person, but actually what we did here is something which uh, never happens in real life, but uh, we, we had actually two, two different head models, uh, person A and person B. And we had a three-dimensional model, so we could rotate the three-dimensional model. But while we were rotating, we were morphing person A into person B into person AB, the morphed in between, and then to person A again. And we showed our subjects in the video clips like that, just what you have seen just before. So, and then later on, we asked uh, and showed them single uh, uh, objects A, or we showed them object B, and asked, uh, is this the same person or not? And when they have seen this video clips where person A and person B <coughs> were in this video clip, uh, continuously morphing back and forth, then they confused A and B, and they said, yes, it's the same person. While we did, of course, control experiments where we had another video clip, and we had actually many video clips, where person A and person B didn't appear in the same video clip, but person A in video clip three and person B in video clip D. And so there, they were not really binding by temporal continuity. And in that case, actually, they distinguished person A from person B. So what, what we conclude from this is, uh, yes, I think the temporal continuity brings these things together into one identity, AB. And uh, there, there are more, more experiments. Actually, Stoner uh, did experiments, Stone did experiments, where he rotated uh, these kind of amoebid-like objects. Uh, and while they learned this object and many other objects, uh, they, they were learning them rotating always in a clockwise fashion. And when he tested then, rotating the same way, the recognition performance was good. But when he had the same object and, uh, rotating counterclockwise, the recognition performance was worse. Even though, I mean, all the images are the same in both sequences, just the order was different. And somehow we enco encode also the order how we learned these objects. So, uh, 
that is a, in a similar supportive result. Then there's, there are more results from our lab that's in, uh, from a PhD student who looked at the importance of, of uh, familiar motion. So when a person is walking towards you and she had lots of these scenes, even though actually what we, what we had was the image was just looming. So nothing happened here with the image and uh, it was just looming towards them. And this looming motion actually uh, helped the recognition performance. Then we had another postdoc in the lab, in, uh, walk one, in, uh, he looked at video scenes. And when you look carefully here, we have an overlay to make it really difficult. We asked, is there a person or not in, uh, in, in, in this video? And actually these are two videos. This is one in, uh, in the front video and uh, in a video behind where a person is, is walking. Can you recognize us? maybe in the front row. While here, we have only a static image. And this is much more difficult. So, I mean, you have a very uh, noisy image, and that was on purpose to make it not too easy. And, uh, but if you have temporal information, and you're looking for, for a person and, uh, and, and walking, this is easier. Now, if you look just for, for, for a person, then a walking person is easier to recognize even in these very cluttered environments. There's another uh, PhD student in the lab who looked at non-rigid motion. I mean, not everything in the world is rigid. When I'm talking here, I mean, my face is constantly changing by making facial expression, moving my, my mouse and so on. So, I mean, we, we should also be able to recognize uh, deforming object. And so he made lots of these kind of n n objects n of, of different forms, but also different deformation patterns. And he could show that this, even this non-rigid motion, we encode not only the form, which is constantly changing, but the way the form is changing. And that helps us to distinguish different kinds of, of objects. N so the temple aspects, n this is uh, finishing the, this up here, is important. And uh, so what can we learn uh, from perception? So I think make use of the time dimension of the visual input, use motion stati statistics, feature tracking, I didn't talk about that, view integration, and also incremental learning. Actually, that's, uh, we had an old PhD thesis, uh, how you can build uh, uh, from tracking and, and objects and, uh, and, and building an incremental n, uh, n, uh, object representation by taking really all these views from a video sequence. And, and we got actually very, very good performance. That was the PhD thesis of, of Christian Wallrafen, who is actually now n, uh, n, just became uh, an assistant professor at Korea University. So n, uh, I made some n, uh, advertisement for him there, and they took him right away. N, uh, so shape, perception of material properties. So n, uh, <clears throat> we cannot only recognize the elephant here, but we can probably recognize what kind of material n, n, the elephant is made of. And n, uh, so here we come to this part where I think n, we can learn from simulating, n, 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 learn from perception and develop some heuristics. and. N, uh, one thing which I learned uh, through this great demo, probably most of you have by now seen it, but I, I love it so much that I have to show it again. So uh, if I tell you that the square A and uh, square B is made of the same material, you would probably uh, say this is totally crazy. And, uh, and uh, now we cover up the surround and, uh, and you see, and, uh, so it's actually the same color here. And, uh, so if we take a photometry, and I mean, I didn't play tracks here I mean, by covering up and changing this here. I mean, of course, you could do that, but I didn't do it. And, uh, you can actually take a light probe and put it here and put it here, and you would see the same value, while we are not seeing the same value. The good reason for it is actually, I mean, the brain doesn't work like a photometer because it doesn't need to know what is the exact light intensity impinging on your, on your retina. It wants to 
make sense of the scene. So it takes into account that this here is in a, casting a shadow and something which is, cast in a, is in the shadow should be darker, but if it's not darker, then it should actually a, be of a lighter material, right? And also, I mean, you can, from the configuration, you can figure out that this uh, should be different than from that one, from the neighborhood. But if you take all that away, then uh, it doesn't work anymore. So I think the, 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 the nice thing here to learn from is uh, we don't work like photometers. We don't care about the physical reality. We want to interpret the scene and make sense of it. And that, for that, you, you need some heuristics. And uh, we thought, uh, uh, can we use some of the heuristics and uh, do something in the image-based flavor, which I talked and which I like so much? And, uh, we don't really have to build a three-dimensional representation of the world exactly around us. And, uh, and, uh, we can actually take an image here and change the material without actually knowing the three-dimensional structure of these vase. And uh, again, to cut a long story short, uh, I show you a video. <coughs> this was work by Eric Reinhardt. And, uh, he made also the music, but I think the music uh, is not so important here. And, uh, so just to, to show you what you can do, and, uh, and if you want to know more about it, and, uh, then uh, look at the SIGGRAPH paper. And, uh, We don't know how light is reflected through a complex surface. That's why we don't. I mean, we have to have something of the background in here, but we don't have to get it right because our brain doesn't get it right. We are not working like ray tracing through it and would immediately see a mistake. We can play really tricks, change uh, the material, make it transparent, and have a little bit of the background in there when we make it transparent. You see it with the vase in a second. So transparency, translucency <coughs> and, uh, coming here. So the nice delft in the vase. And, uh, here, of course, I mean, there is something behind it. And, and uh, so when you make it fully transparent, there, there, there should be, this part should be brighter than this part. But you don't have to get it right because our brain doesn't really do ray tracing. So we can actually make also a transparent elephant. We had a camera, and these were all single shots, no 3D reconstruction. This was an intermediate step, uh, and now we, we simulate the translucency, so make it out of uh, in, uh, some nice uh, translucent material. And uh, the flickering is a little bit because our uh, camera system was not super perfect. But you make now a glass elephant, and you see, I mean, the refractive pattern, something what is behind. But as I said, I mean, you don't really have to get it right in order to look really realistic. So what can we learn here from the material perception? Develop models for representing shape in 2D and not 3D. Maybe in 2.1, what Mumford wants in the proposed or 2.5D, but you don't have to have a full 3D reconstruction. You don't need to have laser scanners to scan your environment in order to go through. We can do without. Now we come to the multi-sensory integration. Of course, when we knock on wood, we, we uh, see not only where we knock on wood, we hear also the sound coming from this location we also have proprioceptive information where actually we are moving our hand. We have our neck muscles which tell us which way we are looking. We are integrating all this in order to get a more robust information about the location here. And each one has different noise distribution. Vision is probably better than, than hearing. So the spreading uh, is, is uh, wider for, uh, for the hearing than for the vision, but if you combine it, and actually that's what Mark Ernst and I and Marty Bank showed, that actually this information is uh, combined in a statistical optimal way uh, using Bayesian integration. So 
that was one part of the story. Uh, to make it very short, you can there are science and nature papers about that you know, from Mark Ernst and, and, and Marty Banks and, and from us, Nature and Neuroscience paper. And, uh, here we look at a, at a different way, and this is maybe getting a little bit, in a, oops, I should hurry up, in, uh, to what we heard also this morning, in, uh, grasping object. What we want to figure out, what kind of representation, even though some people don't like this word, in, uh, in, uh, we built by in, uh, grasping objects, seeing objects, so we made actually a nicely parametric controlled object set where you can see here and we increase in this and along this dimension the micro geometry so we put texture on it so you see it a little bit better here and here we are continuously morphing this shape into something much more pointy here and so we we make a whole object set and we use a 3d printer and, uh, and print these objects, and then in, in haptic in, uh, experiments, in, uh, we, we grasp these objects, feel these objects behind a curtain so they can't see it. Here's the experimenter picking from the object set and put them on a pedestal and give them 15 seconds to explore these object. And then we have a two interval forced choice, and then, uh, no, no, actually we had here, yeah, we did also two interval forced choice, but here we rated the similarity we show you the, this object and then we show you this object and we let them ask, the, we let them rate the similarity between one and seven. So they just come up with a number of how similar these two objects are. And we did that in a, in a haptic condition, but we did the same thing by taking the curtain away and the, had their hands on the table and look at it for, um, uh, for 15 seconds um, uh, or actually less for vision. And then we did uh, both. They can look and feel. Uh, and uh, we use then multidimensional scaling from getting from all these uh, similarity rating numbers. Uh, uh, we get now, uh, with the, the least stress on it, uh, try to, to fit a two dimensional representation of, of, of it uh, using multidimensional scaling. And this is a visual, this is a haptic, and this is a visual haptic. First of all, I mean, the, the, the perceptual representation is very similar to the physical representation, so this is already nice. And uh, when you look at all data, and when you look here, you see actually this is a little bit elongated this way, so the visual system actually pays more attention to the macro geometry or to the shape than to the texture because actually the texture is, is probably less visible, but when you feel it, you actually feel the shape and you feel the texture. And for the, the haptic, it's basically 50-50 between texture and shape. And the vision is putting a little bit more weight on, on, on this here. So, these are two graduate students. Uh, there's much more work on, on this. We also work with blind people, and, you know, but I don't have the time to, to tell you that. So I think what is important to develop common representation that make use of multisensory information. And another thing which we also heard in, in this morning, I think a bootstrap visual learning by haptic ground truths. You know, when children, babies can grasp something, and, uh, they can manipulate it themselves. And actually, we had some work from Christian Weyraten with Julius Sandinis and, and, and work where we, we actually did and, uh, have the robot move in front of the eye the objects and around. And, and uh, so the robot knew at each point also the orientation of the object. And in that case, and, uh, the, and, uh, the recognition rates were better than just looking at, at all these objects from different viewpoints. So if you have additional more information by having, ha having had the chance to hold it in your hand and, uh, to relate the view you are getting to the orientation and space, then you are getting a better recognition performance. So finally, I come to, uh, to the last part, the perception and action. And I said in the beginning, I mean, we want really this loop closed because, I mean, for us, the loop is always closed. I mean, unless we sit in front of the TV, 
in a, in a, in a sofa and, and watch TV, but then, of course, there's also not much brain activity going on. So <laughs> the, we, we, we really interact with you, and, and that's critical. But in order to make these uh, more controllable, we uh, cut out the environment and replace it by a virtual reality. And uh, so we, we have a whole new building where we have the different setups you saw already this year. And uh, we have also something which is very useful for spatial cognition in, in, in experiments because, I mean, the most natural way to interact and to explore the world is still by walking, not by driving or flying. So we built a walking simulator, and that was in a European uh, project, an ISD project, STRAP. And, uh, we built the Cyberwalk, and, uh, which has a lot of uh, technology and application and, uh, parts of it too. And it was actually an enormous work from the Technical University of Munich and their PhD thesis, and, uh, who built really the tools for it. And I show you this now. This is in our tracking hall, so we have to have this helmet with these funny spheres because we have 16 Vicon cameras in this tracking hall. And so there are always a few of these spheres uh, visible to some cameras. And from the different views in, in the cameras, we can reconstruct the position up to a millimeter and, uh, and less than a degree precision. And then we can walk through virtual environments. So this is in a, a virtual city. In a, and now we can actually walk in any direction on this magic carpet here. And, uh, it is, I'll show you in a second how it works. I mean, b basically these are lots of conveyor belts which make a torus and we put that on a transport mechanism. So we get in, uh, one direction in, uh, by these treadmills which are all in sync and the other direction by this in, uh, in, uh, transport mechanism. And so basically, you can walk through virtual environments in any direction, never hit the wall, which we had before in our tracking hall. We had to fit the virtual environment into the physical space of 12 by 15 or 15 by 15 meters. Now we can walk forever, and, uh, as long as the uh, cyberwalk platform doesn't break down, which happens occasionally. So and, uh, this was actually a great tool, and we, we do a lot of <laughs> spatial cognition research with this. And, uh, kind of device. And, uh, we have a lot of other activities which, and, um, given the time uh, now, and, uh, and, uh, I, I, I probably should not and, uh, talk too much about it. And, uh, but, and this is also, I have now a new robotics group in the lab and that's and, uh, and, uh, what we want to do in the future. And, uh, is and, uh, and One thing is, is maybe and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, the haptic feedback, I mentioned that and, uh, really, I mean, we have driving simulators or flight simulators. I think haptic feedback, we have a very nice fo and, and force feedback steering wheel where you really get a good sense of when you lose grip and, uh, when, when you go around the corner. I think this is information which is very important and we want to, to build that also into a fly-by-wire and, and uh, systems and, uh, and we have done uh, preliminary experiments using this nice Omega device and, uh, from and, uh, the, and the company from EPFL startup and, uh, and, uh, to really give very nice force feedback and, and we can fly in the airplanes. And I mean, just to see with force feedback, I mean, this is task and, uh, and, uh, of, of going, changing altitude, for example, flying this Beaver aircraft and you have much more fluctuations in this red without force <laughs> feedback. You can do much better when you have you know, force feedback and basically feel the, the pressure on the, on the ailerons. So, and, uh, yeah, there's, there's more. And, uh, and then there's this biodynamic feed through. Actually, an interesting problem in, in, in flying aircrafts or helicopters is you know, when you are moving around, and here he is, has a helicopter side stick. When he's moving and you have turbulence, it's actually the whole body is moving and you are moving your control stick, which of course gives you turbulence even more. So this is actually a problem in, 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 in any kind of in a, in a helicopter flying in, in big turbulences. I recently talked to a helicopter pilot who was not strapped in well enough and he was jumping up and down in the seat and he had his collective 
and going up and down, and the, he accelerated actually the disturbances through the uh, outside disturbance, and, and he got in almost into trouble uh, until he realized what was going on, and he let loose. And, uh, so this is something, it's a new area which we really try to explore more. Then, of course, we have also you know, facial recognition. I should not talk about this. This is our motion capture setup. But just one thing is you know, we, we actually have now a very nice animation-based you know, system, which you know, actually you know, we got. Yeah, I, mean, I have to show you this because it's so <laughs> much fun. <laughs> no, sorry. No. You know the Ekman uh, facial action coding system. We got somebody in the lab actually who can actually control all his muscles. And uh, so we took lots of videos, uh, recordings, and motion capture of this person. And Martin Bright can do that also very well. So there are a couple of people who can do that. That was a good basis uh, for us, uh, really uh, using the motion capture data. And now we, we can actually look at videos and pass now the video n n information here, n also using these markers, n n and n really get here you see the different motion channels, so these action units, so to speak, squinting and n eye opening and closing. So we can actually get this in real time and then take an, an arbitrary 3D model of a face n and animate it in real time. And uh, that's actually uh, being built in a new uh, project, an uh, EU project, which is just starting in, in, in a month or so in, uh, in Tango, and into a project uh, where, uh, from uh, Mario Kleiner, a PhD student, and uh, Chris Curio, who wants to build a virtual mirror so basically, an, and have an, an analysis part and a synthesis part, and you can look in front of a computer monitor and see your own face. And, uh, you make faces, and the computer monitor makes the same faces. But of course, now we can play tricks. Now we can per perturbate the channels. So when you smile, and, and the, the, the video monitor frowns at you. And, uh, and, and uh, you can also emphasize something or, or less. And I think that has <coughs> lots of potential in, uh, in, in, uh, in the psychiatry, and that's we are, we are trying to build a new in, uh, European project in, uh, on, on based on this, on self-perception, and work with in, uh, in, uh, in psychiatry in the people, and also in, in healthcare and rehabilitation. So in, uh, when you have somebody who has in, a, a stroke and cannot move part of it, we, we can help them, hopefully. In, uh, to, to, to train his uh, facial <coughs> action. So I think I should stop here. The conclusions you can read. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I click through it because they are recording it, then they can do that and uh, they see everything. There's more on dynamic faces. There's a book coming out soon in MIT Press where we actually tried actually to get people from psychophysics, physiology, and computation I think this would be a nice uh, source of information for faces and uh, aiming to bridge science and technology, <laughs> that's this. I hope I could show you that it makes sense to bring all these things together and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.